hello, hello, good evening, and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth, the events coordinator for Gibson's Bookstore, and we are very pleased to be welcoming for our very final uh, author event of 2021, Alexandria Peary, the New Hampshire State Poet Laureate. We are very excited to have you here tonight. Um, you have a new book, which is The Battle for Silicon Valley at Daybreak, not at dawn, The Battle of Silicon Valley at Daybreak. Thank you so much for joining us to share that book with us tonight. My pleasure. Oh, so um, you are the State Poet Laureate, and we are really pleased to have you. Um, please tell me a little bit about your book just before you hop into... Um, just before you hop into poems. I know that uh, you said it was defying genre, but tell me just a little bit about why you were writing this one. Yeah, sure. So Battle of Silicon Valley at Daybreak, I would say has two big motifs going on. Um, one is, and I'm gonna use a big clunky word, but it's a lot more exciting than it sounds, intertextual. I'm very interested in having a couple of genres of writing um, be inside poetry. So to expand the boundaries of genre and not have everything be compartmentalized and in silos in, um, in, in art and work. This is why this book has a short story at the end called Decameron, which is a rip off of Boccaccio's um, 14th century piece. And it also has uh, an essay at the beginning. Um, so trying to mix the genre. And then I would say the other thing is that um, I'm very interested in social media and all its concerns as well. So those are the two big themes of the book. All right, well, please uh, take us into this book. Sure. Um, first off though, I would like to just say a few shout outs to people who may be in the audience here. I see that Jennifer Hill is in the audience. Jennifer, can you turn on your screen and say hi for a second here? If you don't mind doing that. Jennifer is the person. Uh, anyway, Jennifer made the wonderful cover. So I don't know if you can see the cover of the book. It's a terrific image. Um, so Jennifer made it. And another shout out in case she's here, Alice Rays. By any chance, is Alice Rays here? Well, anyway, she's my high school English teacher and I think she's coming and I haven't seen her in 40 plus years. So this is very exciting. And lastly, Laura Mullen. I know Laura's here. I see her on the screen. My fabulous poetry teacher. I owe her so much. She is just the heart of my work. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for everybody being here. So what I would like to actually do is I would like to just talk briefly about some poet um, offerings that I'm giving as Poet Laureate for residents in New Hampshire. Um, then we'll go through some poems. I have a PDF of the poems, which I'll put in the chat function for you. If you're somebody who prefers to uh, see a poem on Zoom as opposed to just having you hear it, okay? And then lastly, if we have time, I wanna run through a brief prompt so that everybody can try to write a poem in form about social media. So that's kind of the lay of the land, but thank you again very much for being here. So here's the first thing I wanna say that, um, first off, one of my initiatives as Poet Laureate that I'm really, really, really proud of, um, I wanna share the screen and I would be grateful if everybody, can you all see Under the Madness magazine? Is it on the screen for you? I can see yes. it. Okay, awesome. All right, so, and I know in the crowd right now, there are some of the editors who are part of this magazine. So Under the Madness magazine is a magazine that I started working with teen editors from New Hampshire um, largely from the North Country, plus May, a student at Salem State. I know May's in the audience, who is also a New Hampshire resident. We are currently open for submissions from any teen, you know, so 13 to 19, writing in English and anywhere in the world. Um, and here is some of the information. Our first submission period closes on January 20th, 2022. So I'll try to, if I have a moment, put this in the chat function so you can download it. But if you have writers in your life working in English, 
please send them our way. Um, the address is right at the top here under the Madness magazine for our first issue. The magazine, in addition to having offerings in creative writing, so poetry, fiction, and um, creative nonfiction, we also have events coming up and we have blog posts written by the editors. And we just closed our first kickoff poetry contest. Um, so all kinds of exciting news. So please share that with anybody that you know who's a teen who's writing in English. We would love to see their work. Um, all right, so I'm gonna share one more thing with you. Trying. No, get rid of that. Okay, does everybody see the Jack and Hannah McCarthy scholarship? It's on the screen. I know Hannah's in the room. So Hannah, I saw you on the screen. This scholarship is currently open. We're looking at applications until March 31st, 2022. It's $1,000 for a New Hampshire resident studying writing in some form. It can be professional writing, journalism, creative writing at the undergraduate or graduate school level. And so here are um, some of the stipulations and guidelines. And I'll, when I get a moment, I'll try to put it in the chat function, but this is an opportunity purely for New Hampshire residents. The other one, anybody, okay? So, all right. Um, at the end of the session, I'll, I'll put it in the chat function, not now. Um, okay, so. Thanks so much for being here. So what I thought I would do is I will put um, a PDF right now of poems I'd like to read tonight in the chat function for you. I'm going to try, <laughs> gosh. Oh. Elizabeth, is there some way of uh, putting something in the chat function here? Um, there should be, you should be, do you um, have it? Uh, there should be, if you go over to the chat sidebar, there should be a little page with a, a corner folded down. Yeah, got it. Okay, bear with me. You think somebody who does this all the time as a teacher would know how to do this, but okay, here goes. So in the chat function just now, I put a PDF for anybody who would like to just see the poems as they're being read. You can download them onto your own computer. Um, I'm going to close that. So uh, I'm going to read a series of poems. The first one I'm going to show on the screen briefly, just so we can just get a sense of what it looks like. And then I'm going to close the screen. doesn't want to be shown. Okay, you see on the screen the cover? Excellent. All right, so just briefly so you get a sense of what it looks like. This poem is sort of short and non-stanzaic. It's poem with fruit flies, okay? So I'll be reading that, and then I'll be reading the sibling poem right after called the story poem. All right, so I think what I want you to know about poem with fruit flies is as follows. It's an example of a poem in which I'm trying to break through that wall. Um, the one that genre keeps everything separate. I'm trying to let poetry have a more actual part in the living world to the point where poetry can be an object that's visited by something like fruit flies. So hence it's gotta be something that's a fruit or nutritious or you know, a natural object. Um, and if you notice, if you look at the poem, it's very jagged because every line, even though it's a short non-stanzaic poem, every line ends on a preposition. So to, for, in, with. I'm trying to replicate movement, the movement of fruit flies, something that moves, the poem is moving through its line breaks. Um, you will notice by the end of the poem that it takes kind of a gory turn, okay? So it starts off talking about these fruit flies, but then it moves to an image of a monk. And what I would say about this is that this image of the monk, the swarming swarm of the lines and the fruit flies that becomes 
his fingerprint, it's blood red, it's ready, the monk. I would say it anticipates a lot of the other poems later in the book. Um, a lot of the poems in the book are about sort of a spiritual battle against social media. So, okay, here goes. So, poem with fruit flies. Fruit flies in the ballpoint bowl are attracted to the voice in the blue ink of script pears, the calibri nectarines in a bowl set at the start of a sentence, at the end or within, easy reach in the middle on a doily. In the depicted space, in the wings, fruit flies collectively swing outside the margin on the left, then the right, like a flock of commas in a tight pack. As the poem itself floats to the top of the page, rotates counterclockwise like a face on a pillow, gives us a sideways look, beheaded ghost warrior monk in several spots on the screen, in reverse, upside down, a little whirl of phrases, like a red wax stamp in the signature style, an iconography by which she could be immediately recognizable, a still life fingerprint. All right, so oftentimes when I'm working, I write sibling poems. And so this, po this last poem, Poem with Fruit Flies, these are not quite fruit flies, not quite a poem. They're interacting in a different way, as I mentioned. The next one, the story comb, also has bugs in it. There are a lot of insects in this book. And I think the reason why is that there are, insects are the armies that are surrounding us all the time. They, they drastically outnumber us. They're <laughs> complex organizations and societies. And in this collection of poems, um, they're like a miniature version of the armies that keep reappearing throughout the book. So the story comb, I made up that word. I put together story and comb like honeycomb, right? So uh, again, a reference to a, an insect. As I said, it's a sibling poem, but what I would say about this one is this, that we got fruit flies again and they're interacting with the poem but this time they're doing something different. The fruit flies are affecting the poem. They're bringing more written material to the poem. They're also altering the phase at which the poem is at. Is it done? Is it at the beginning? Is it at the middle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I think that's what I'd say about this one. And it's non-stanzaic again. Yeah, so. And I would also say this one hints a little bit at some of the cyber crime, et cetera, et cetera, that appears later in the book. The story poem. Fruit flies land on the poem and change the poem, downloading content. Fruit flies are flecks of being and energy, shifting the piece closer to pre-writing and propelling it hours ahead to editing, sending it back, the poem resting on a simple table near the open window of a line break. Because of drowsy proofreading moths and spell check wasps, fruit flies add voice to metallic fruit and softening the font. Fruit flies add their two syllables, the voiceless sound of a labidental fricative, meaning the vocal cords do not vibrate. Unlike honeybees with their pom-pom socks, like pocket-sized yellow dual language dictionaries. German bees, the Italian honey bee, and Russian bees, though it's a narrative bee who lures us into the story comb. Phrase by phrase, a maze, so a mascot hornet emerges from the margin, bootlegs a sweet peachy part, a noun with hooks, causing fruit flies to land again on the poem and change the poem. All right, so <laughs> two poems with fruit flies in it. So uh, here's the thing about social media, right? 
here we all are all on Zoom, right? Um, what I would say about social media in terms of this book is that I think you need to be a spiritual warrior at times uh, to sort of fight off the ego, the ego fumes of Twitter, of um, all the different social media status updates and whatnot. So one part of this book is about that battle um, to fight off ego and social media. And then, so that's this poem. Then the poem right after it, and then the poem after that, are more about the larger political landscapes around social media and the battles that are fought beyond the individual self. So the next one I'm gonna to read to you is called Social Media Enso. And I know I've got some of my mindfulness writing students in the crowd here, so you all know what this means, but for everybody else who's not taking mindful writing or doesn't know from their own life. Uh, Enso is um, a circle, a calligraphy circle, sometimes broken and sometimes whole around a mantra or a saying. But in this poem, I'm trying to suggest that the circle, so just imagine this jagged single brushstroke circle, the circle instead is a mirror frame, okay, for ego. So social media Enso. And by the way, I'm not immune to it. <laughs> so I'm not saying I'm immune to it, okay. And, uh, and the thing that happens at the end of the poem with the, the Christian martyrs, minus the Christian martyrs, but the crypt actually happened to my family and it's not a joke, it really happened. Okay, so here goes. Social media and so. Look daily, check every 20 minutes inside this gate of calligraphy made with a single brush stroke, mirror, mirror on the wall, a background of vowels, oh, um, like eye holes, split screen, ego is lessness, a white scroll for Facebook, who's the smartest, status update, sexiest, wealthiest, busiest, talented as them all. Notice a pattern of skulls, in the social stationery, deadheads or deadhead, a long haul without paying passengers or freight or to ride without buying a ticket. Dead flowers snapped away to encourage others to bloom with encrypted information. Because you lost your iPhone pod pad in an underground tomb and a hundred thousand Early Christian martyrs, like adults at a sleepover, see the screen illuminate in the ashen dark. As you send yourself a message, where are you? And try to summon your lost but longing from the hotel room. This is no ordinary love, a brushstroke to represent the moment zeitgeist. So, and we did lose an iPad in a crypt surrounded by skeletons and bodies. This is a true story. <laughs> I'm not saying anybody turned it on. That all imaginative. All right, so I hope you get a sense that, you know, that's a poem and there were a lot of puns in that one, right? You know, with the eyes, if you have it on the screen with you, you saw the, um, you know, the eyes and the being and all that, the existential words, but also the whole thing of mirror, mirror on the wall, the ego looking into the mirror, um, the deadheads, all the different definitions of deadhead turning into the Christian, the martyrs. Um, so there you go. So the next one I'm going to read is um, rhetorical invention at the pole. So this is one of the poems in the book that has uh, a Buddhist monk-like figure in it. And I'm just going to leave it at that. And it's in couplets. So if you have it on your screen, you know, it's the, two, the couplets, the two lines stanzas. Rhetorical invention at the pole. Mr. X and the dream blog is also called portrait of a monk getting new idea. Black hairs sprout from chin, Spanish moss on the side of tarred telephone pole where a message has been stapled, a poster. Need roommate, need a new religion, 
and he reads with bloodshot eyes a title going public or publicity, a theme, a religious treaty, a lost cat. Standing behind him is a demon who wears a necklace of microaggressions, past critic on standby power, vampire power, phantom or ghost load of leaking electricity, a glowing civilization in the valley ahead, a troll farm. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I'm going to read a few more. And um, so the, the next one I'm going to read goes off of that poem. It's also about social media and the internet. This one is about the, the dark web, the dark net. And I would say about this one and the poem that comes after it, they're both massive journeys. <laughs> so whereas the previous poems are kind of static, somebody's looking at something or they've lost an item, their iPad, iPod, and they're looking for it. Um, the next two poems have somebody moving. And I heart my cat still life. I was thinking of, you know, coffee mugs with I heart my cat on it. You know, mine just says New Hampshire, but you know, I heart my cat type thing. Or um, yeah, so I heart my, heart my cat. But what you should know about this poem is this, that it's telling a story. So the first stanza is about language. Somebody's looking, it's actually the lines are talking about themselves. The lines are talking about the sentence structure. So it's very kind of self-involved on the language level. And then we get a quote from this guy, Kenneth Goldsmith. It's from his, one of his books about the language of the internet. And what happens is a sinkhole or something appears because of the language and the speaker in the poem goes on this crazy ride. And I would say this crazy ride ends on things that are so much more serious than sitting, whether one is sitting in their own ego fumes, much bigger issues, okay? <laughs> so. Okay, here goes. I heart my cat still life. Heaped on a cut crystal sentence of average length with two or three clauses, one independent and the rest dependent, the square fruit is in automatic or blue accent too with a repeated line from a disclaimer, making window blinds lowered to prevent a migraine. What Kenneth Goldsmith said is, our screen world is merely a thin skin under which resides miles and miles of language. Line command descriptions of systems unfurling, fonts loading, and graphic packages decompressing, and the HTML under the floor is like a sinkhole beneath the basement. As I retype in bright January light, Wallace Stevens's Sunday morning on my Dell laptop, coffee and oranges in a sunny chair. I reach for a bluish apple and take a bite when a mewing sound comes from the Persian rug covering the DOS startup text. It's kittens on the job, kittens with quarterbacks, kittens on the naked shoulders of firemen and police, kittens with priests. An adorable blue-eyed Siamese poses close to basic sentences like in an early reader. Script Kitty plays with Dust Bunny. See Script Kitty run. What? So that kitten is clickbait? throwing glances over its shoulder like grenades. Pretty Kitty runs straight to the door of the dark web hidden behind a designer pillow on the wingback chair guarded by a dozen dust bunnies carrying AK-47. Actual kittens held for ransom by an army of bots. You have four hours to locate the nearest Bitcoin ATM. Your time starts now. Okay, okay, Mr. Booming Trailer Movie Voice, Movie Trailer Voice. None of this is what I had in mind 
when I typed coffee and oranges, though it's because I typed coffee and oranges that I'm running into a labyrinth of illicit desire and trade through the dream market for murder slash mayhem as vendor editors shout kill rates, past the cliff cave system with holes marked elections and cyber marriages. Who would have guessed that a 20th century American poet stands above such darkness, such places of consequence? With seconds to spare, I avoid biblical punishments. A wreath of bees will exit from my mouth. My nephew's dorm room will catch on fire. A flash flood will claim my baby grand piano. What about Robert Hayden, Ashbury, Jane Miller, Jory Graham? Enter here, carrying the last four digits, your mother's maiden, employee identification, evil eye, crucifix, carved man, your belief in democracy, your Hail Mary, security question, return policy, your order number, your code, push aside that boulder of disclaimer. Yo no. Okay, so um, take a break for a second here. Does anybody want to say anything? I feel like I'm just blah blah blah. Anybody want to ask anything? Maybe Elizabeth, we'll just do a brief Q and A now, and then we'll read some more poems. Is that okay? Anybody want to ask anything? <clears throat> I love all the no, bees in your I poem. Want to Somebody loved all the bees in my like. Isn't oh wait, was that Mike Nelson saying that? Yes, I knew it. Mike likes bees. Okay, thank you, Mike. <laughs> oh. This has been wonderful. Oh, hi, Hannah. I recognize your <laughs> voice. Hannah is the person for whom the scholarship is named after. Hannah, do you want to show your face and say hi? No. Or... No. no. It's too late at night. <laughs> anyway, seriously consider donating or money to that scholarship I mentioned earlier or telling people about it in New Hampshire because it's a great one and it's an honor of her. She just a fabulous proponent of people's education throughout her life. So, well, thank you, Hannah. Um, anybody ever feel like they sit in ego fumes with um, social media or is it just me? Oh, <laughs> oh I heard some yes. <laughs> Does anybody know what I mean by ego fumes? Like, you, you know that sensation? I, I bet you do, right? All right, so, okay. You, we, <laughs> oh, hold, hold. we have to stop for a minute. I have to say, Alice, it's been 50 years, 40 years. This is my high school English teacher. Where are you, Alice? Can you, you can see me, so it's not fair. I'm 40 years older, but I can't see you. Um, Alice, you probably see her name at the bottom of the screen. Hope you can hear me. Was my high school English teacher in Maine, and I have never forgotten her. She was such a, such a character and so um, fostered creativity in her students and just, just, you were fabulous. I have never, ever forgotten you, Alice. So, okay. <laughs> See, I look old. Alice. It's been 40 years. Okay. All right. So, uh, would you like me to read more poems? Yes. Okay. So, um, I'm so pleased to see everybody. It's so nice to see people, students and colleagues. Thank you. All right. So, the next poem, speaking of colleagues, <clears throat> it's called Hills of Bureaucracy. Now, okay, Woo. I don't want to see myself and all of a sudden all I am doing is see myself. So hold on a second here. Okay, Hills of Bureaucracy. You see that, do you see it on the PDF? It's this long skinny poem, you see it there? Now, believe it or not, all the poets in the room can attest this too. It sometimes it takes years to finish things, right? So even though this mentions the pandemic maybe twice, maybe three times, I wrote it like five years ago, okay? <laughs> so it's not, it's not about what we're going through. It's, it's an older poem. And um, let's just say this one, a little lighter than the last one. You know, the last one, uh, well, you know what it was about. You heard what it was about. This one's about that 
frustration that everybody has when you're caught up in just bureaucratic, nightmarish, stupid meetings, you know, where nothing is coming through, or you have paperwork to fill out, and you get lost and lost. We all know that feeling, right? So I thought, hmm, I'd like to write a poem called Hills of Bureaucracy. And I wanted to show somebody, not that I've had any experience at work with bureaucracy, never, never. I've never had any experience with it. Right. Uh, I wanted to show somebody going through this landscape and what you'll probably notice um, when you are when you are looking at the poem or hearing the poem is that there's a lot of language in there that's bureaucratic as well. So one of the things I do as a writer is in playing with genre, I frequently either quote or use the, the formal conventions of other genres in my poems. Again, why I do this is to enlarge the paving, the pavement, the mental creative pavement, the, the plane I'm working on. Um, okay, so here goes. I hope you enjoy this poem and I would really love to hear if anybody else has similar frustrations. <laughs> okay, here goes. Hills of bureaucracy. In the event that the engagement shall be prevented by reason of war, active God, strike, civic tumult, epidemic, or any other cause beyond the control of either agreeing party, which is deemed to be force majeure, the agreed parties shall be respectively relieved of their obligations contained herein and return to the rolling hills of bureaucracy. A deep green field of barley, more hills with hay bales, no sky, an argyle of crops, following emergency exits and evacuation plans to the long and winding road that leads to your door. That would be 15A on the updated form, the red door with a mat and rack for your shoes of a cottage in the village. Let the minutes state, you've had a tiresome journey through various causes on the lavender road, past blaze orange fields that shall include revolutions, riots, war, acts of enemy, national, state, local emergency, strikes, floods, fires, epidemics, quarantine, embargoes, or unusually severe weather, and that we're not responsible or liable for any loss of damage, for delays in performance, or failure to perform. The 10 point font path has brought you to the open forum on comprehensive internalization, where the committee invites input from the whole community about where we are at and where we should go, which thatched houses for which gas stations in the settlements of educational plans, mission statements, high internal hiring, the designated spokesperson from the Institutional Advancement Office is explaining, this is a plan for all of us, a family reunion hosted by human resources in partnership with business intelligence, focus on core academic function. So the member at the back of the conference room knitting woolly yarn clouds as stress relief should get a grip We've all stopped our planting in favor of administering to attend this conference on the administration of planting. CC all the assistant to vice associate interim acting chief head of associate director. Staples for vineyards. Collated construction plans are in departmental mailboxes. Approving the minutes from yesterday Let's send the next presenter back like a salmon stunned with frustration, who weeps with frustration into the whirling vortex of a policy about policy, a few hay bales, shade trees for cattle, or the subcommittee to this committee. Though party one is not a fish, but a person who must drive back in his rental Kia, the application form was incomplete. Next order of business, those ornamental wild grasses planted last year for the parade, tall on the highway divide on Route 2 South, junction of JFK Boulevard and South Main, a death trap or death wish. 
All right. Anybody ever have these feelings besides me about bureaucracy? Can I see a show of hands? <laughs> How about academic bureaucracy? Any academics? Up there? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. Yay. Yeah, Laura. <laughs> All right. So, um, so there's a poem skinny long it's meant to move very very fast um, it's meant to show a journey and I think you could probably hear how it had other kinds of other kinds of um, writing inside inside the poem right so bureaucratic writing all right so I'm gonna read a, we're gonna take a little turn here so I'm gonna read a poem called title covered in flies. So you've got insects again, okay? Um, but what I would say about this one is, and if you see it on the screen, it's got two stanzas. So, and what I'm talking about in this one is um, realization that oftentimes what we abhor about other people, we're actually very close to being ourselves. And it's that sort of swing between um, massive self-acceptance and also massive self-loathing, massive acceptance of others, massive loathing towards others. So a more of a spiritual poem. Okay, so here goes. Title covered in flies. Flies that in a previous life were horses in a field workhorses winking and flicking their tails under an omniscient horse chestnut tree so close in those green hallways to the next appointment of strong reactions. Full circle, what I dislike, even despise, at some point I was, I did, and the tree's rope swing untethers, sways in small expanding circles hypnotizing tobacco stained slats of a barn, aligning needles of hay. Green fires that were fly covered horses in a field. We reject ourselves beside the ruins of a farmhouse not ready to burn itself down. I think I'm going to, um, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna read a short little poem called How I Was Raised. And um, this poem I would say is, I would say it's about um, being working class and having very hard working parents who, um, didn't have a chance to go to school, but loved art, loved art. And um, yeah, and so the first stanza is a lot of details from childhood household. And then the second stanza is sort of an elevation, um, a release to art. So I guess we could think about it, okay? So how I was raised, um, how I was raised. A toy plank on a desk beside the S volume from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends Behind Plastic Ivy on the Toilet Tank crochet cover on Kleenex box in the living room of self-taught art or art. A plank is like a desk, but at this incline, intuition is scattered red rubber balls, points along a line, run over thoughts of stars and a window left open at the top. So a flock of instincts, silver flash in the ceiling. All right, so I'm gonna read two more poems and then um, take a Q and A. And if you would like to hang out for a poetry prompt, I do have a fun one on social media we can do, but we'll see if you're tired or if you wanna do it. So, the second to last poem in this book, I you have um, one of my mentors once said that she loved to her own books. She wanted to make sure that when she flipped through it, that the poems 
had different page appearances that she wasn't always repeating herself. Um, so in this book, there were different sizes and shapes poems everywhere. And quite a few of them are prose poems, which means that the, they're not broken into lines. And so they look like little paragraphs. And two of the prose poems in this book are plays off of The Last Supper. So this one, paraphrased First Supper, it's talking about language again and borrowing, so paraphrasing, right? And um, what I think you should know about it is that it's, well, it's a, like the Last Supper, I'm really interested in scenes of people coming together. They're all eating. <laughs> And it's got this higher spiritual reason for being together. There's a reference in here to a snow cat. This is a, the poet Wallace Stevens, one of his first poems ever, 20th century poet, great poet, was about this cat that kept leaping, but it wasn't quite a cat. Ah, so S, like your cat, but it wasn't quite a cat, okay? So here goes. Paraphrased first supper. Still life in the middle of a sentence, still life at the end of a sentence, still life at the beginning. Every time we tried to pass an item, the bread basket, a fork of recommendation, the ghost of red wine, over the plank table, a still life blocked our attempt. Wherever our white glove went, operated by the eye, the still life moved. It leapt to the middle of a sentence, to the start, to the end, across a plot ironed into table linens, a feast shared by friends and not servants. It was simultaneously a first discourse and farewell discourse. It leapt cat-like, the snow cat, the snow leopard that moved like machinery, bristled, blocking us this way, then that way. To love one another as I have loved you was how the toast went. We had rented event space at the Lions Club, not the Rotary, for the tiled vanishing point in the Renaissance perspective behind the banquet. As the polar cat rubbed our ankles in secret under the table, we listened to the discourse of farewell on the first page of the first book, all 12 of us, collected like poems. One of us was thinking, maybe it's easy to be loved by friends when the stakes are so high after knocking over the salt cellar. He is the scowling figure with the loosened tie. Then the more outgoing of us, the thrower of our perpetual bachelor parties declared to every folding chair in the bronze words of the founder, Melvin Jones, you can't get very far until you start doing something for somebody else. A basket of fruit blocked the end of the world, the beginning of the world, a still life like a planet, an earthy anecdote before an invective against swans. We picked up our appetizer spoons and ate the inside of parentheses. We used the wrong spoon, the demitasse instead of bullion. When we finally ate anything, it was rough and tangy, happy loss, wild parsnips from a lawn of scallions. And um, thank you. The last poem I'm gonna read is the last poem in the book before the short story. And, um, and then we'll do a Q and A if you'd like to ask some questions. And so this one is called Gallery Galaxy. Um, and it has these lines, if you have it on the page, that just sort of move across the space. Things get repeated, but get altered by their being repeated in the poem. And I would say the inspiration for this one comes from traveling like in Italy with all these paintings and you know, big churches and museums are just stacked all the way up. And they're often these gloomy allegories of battle and you know, all, all that kind of stuff, all right? So, <clears throat> but at the end, so I end the whole book on a note of optimism. Okay, so gallery, galaxy. The figures of allegory huddle on flotillas of agenda. On their flotillas of agenda, e-signed documents 
held by angels from the messenger service. Europa, pale, big-thighed, accustomed to riding perchin of weather, balances on a PDF pontoon boat. The field commander transforms into a dolphin. The stern man in a moth-eaten crimson suit on his cathedra carried onto a rowboat. Entourage of naked and pained saints in a sea of man of war, frigate, aircraft carriers autocorrected to flotillas of agenda. All parties agree to set aside their world cracking differences. And so the sky replaces the cathedral ceiling. So thank you very much. So if we have any questions anybody wants to ask, I think we probably have time for a few, right, Elizabeth? We do, we do. If anybody has any questions, now would be a lovely time to um, start them. I suppose I would ask first, what's next for you? Oh, for me, I've always got multiple projects going on all the time. So <laughs> multiple books floating around. <laughs> yeah. Um, Elizabeth, and uh, could you um, either enable the chat so we could uh, tell Alex how incredibly fabulous that was, or maybe we could just make a space here for applause before we move on to the Q&A, because that was an incredible reading of amazing poems. So let me just orchestrate that. Applause now. Bravo! <laughs> yes, well done, well done. So can you tell me a little bit about the title, Battle of Silicon Valley at Daybreak? Yeah, so I don't know if Jennifer's still here with us, but so it's very happen, happy chance here. So I wrote this poem, which I didn't read tonight, that's a massive battle scene. Instead of soldiers, there are emojis, all kinds of emojis fighting battles um, in the way that... Um, less privileged people have often had to fight and sacrifice their lives for the wealthy people that are staring and looking at the mural. But anyway, so I wrote this poem, got all these emojis in it, and it got published in a magazine, right? And so I thought, well, I'll check out if it ever got published. And it was so cool because I type in Battle of Silicon Valley at daybreak, looking for my poem, and up pops Jennifer's painting. <laughs> I was like, this is terrific. So I couldn't believe my luck. And I don't, I don't know if you can see it on the screen here, you know, it's two part, right? It's got, it's just fabulous and it's interactive too. So Jennifer, if you're around, put the link in the chat function because you should check it out. She's got this video she's also made of the painting. It's just great. So I really wanted a, a title that captured, I think with the spirit of what's going on right now in our culture and our society. I mean, it's, it's all over the place that the social media messes we're in, so. Wonderful. Did you say that you had a writing, a poetry prompt for us? Yeah, I don't know. Do you, are we all tired or do we wanna try something? I think I'm, I think I'm a little, oh, there's Jennifer. There is uh, the link in the chat and um, I'll save that and keep it in the, um, uh, I'll put it in when we record this, when we put it up on YouTube, I'm going to save that link and put it in the description too. Okay. Um, are people interested in trying a one minute poem or two minute poem? I see a show of hands. It's okay if we're all tired, and, you know. Just, if, it's, if it's a short one, let's try a short one. <laughs> okay. All right, you all need some paper, please. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, May is going to like this because maybe we just did this in class about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. We're going to do something called a sin cane, okay? Spelled um, C-I-N-Q-U-A-I-N. -I -I and all it is is this. Don't worry, it's not stressful, right? In reality, it's a five-line poem. And in reality, the actual form each line has, the first line has one stress, the second line has two stresses, the third line has three, you see where I'm going, right? But that's too complicated for us on Zoom to do something real fast. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna walk you through something here and without, um, don't censor yourself, you know, it's, it's you know, 7.54 p.m. at least Eastern Standard Time, you're probably tired, you know, just, just see what comes up, okay? So 
from. I'd like you to think about some aspect of social media. Okay, so it's going to be a synquain about social media. So five line poem. I'm going to give you the prompts here. Okay, and so to whatever I say, just jot down. We'll see what whatever comes. Okay, here goes. Line one can only have one word. So what do you want to put on it? Line one. Line two has got to have a color and a verb in it. A color and a verb in it, two words in whatever order you want. Line three, three words, line three, has to start with a preposition, two, four, with, that kind of stuff. Do whatever you want for the rest of it. Line four, four words, ask a question. And last line, line five, five words. Answer your question, only it has to be in a list, L-I-S-T. So answer your question, but it has to be in a list. All right, so we all know that you created that literally in like, like what, a minute tops? Does anybody want to read it out loud? Just end on your words here, just for kicks. Nobody's going to judge you. Or put it in the chat function. Oh, I hear a volunteer, John. Yes, sure. <laughs> all right. Mark. Black and blue to market share, for whom the bell tolls, clangs, peals, rings, cracks. That was fabulous. Can you read that one more time? Mark, black, blue to market share, for whom the bell tolls clangs, peels, rings, cracks. That was truly great. I love, so John, if you get a chance, send that to me if you don't, if you want to share. Sure, I'll anybody, happily do it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Anybody else want to read theirs just for kicks? Oh, Erica's typing hers in. Anybody else want it? Brooke, how about you, Brooke? Yay! I called on you. I like old times. Do you I know, to... right? I well, I don't have to read it. I can put it in the chat. If you... Oh, you can read it. Dude. <laughs> no. I feel like I did it wrong. <laughs> oh, who cares? She's Brooke, okay. by the way, is a fabulous writer, former student of mine for many, many years. Do you want to just say it? I don't want to force you. So no, it's okay. Okay, I'll say it. I just think I did it wrong, but I, I followed the rules. Okay. <laughs> um, forest run green with found things. Have you seen them? Staircase, raven, bridge, snow, silence. 
That was a good prompt. Thank you, Alex. All right. I think one Erica was going to put hers in, but S, are you trying to? Did you want to read yours? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I probably did it wrong, <laughs> but it there's really no wrong, right, in poetry. So Twitter, blue anger with white teeth. What purpose are you? Divide, assault, mock, mimic, rage. <laughs> that was amazing. Oh, thank you. Oh man, I'm so glad I actually did this. Okay, anybody else before we call it tonight? Looks like somebody's in the chat function here. Was it supposed to be about social media? It doesn't matter. It was, okay. but who, who cares, right? I played with the bees. Oh, Mike, read it. Okay. Bees, yellow, blurry, bumbling, humbling, working. Where are they going? Under, somewhere, in, over, there. Dang, I continue to think this, this state's just rocking it with the creativity here. All right. <laughs> Erica put hers in the chat. I'd love to read hers out. Um, Erica's says, watching, colors scrolling through the morass. Who put this here? Friends, not friends, strangers, me. <laughs> Dang, these are so good. See, okay, you're, you're all my friends. You have my emails. Email me and I'll put them on the blog if you're so inclined. But if you don't, don't. Wonderful. Um, so I think we're, we're out of time, right, Elizabeth? But so I do. I kind of want to read this, this other one that May put in, which is really good. I'm going to read this one. Um, compute, shattering blue to combat programming. How do we compute? Remove batteries, shut down, disconnect. Great work, May, as usual. This is good. We have, I don't know that we've ever ended an event with a, a writing prompt. This is fun. I should have been doing this over the last year. This is how I roll, right? Everybody comes to my events. We always do some writing. So, hey, um, last note here, please. I did put in the chat function, those two attachments, the Jack and Hannah McCarthy scholarship, please download and share with the New Hampshire students of any age in school that you know of, okay? In any school, it doesn't have to be, they have to be residents, but they can be studying in California. And then second of all, send the teenagers in your life to this magazine. Uh, we are getting great submissions from all over the place and we wanna keep that going, okay? So thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Elizabeth. Absolutely, okay. thank you for joining us again. Battle of Sil Silicon Valley at Daybreak is available from Gibson's Bookstore. Thank you, Alexandria Perry, New Hampshire State Poet Laureate for joining us here this evening. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Bye. 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 Thank you.